In this video, I'm going to introduce three advanced logo design techniques, show you them in use in some famous logos, and demonstrate how you can begin experimenting with them in Adobe Illustrator. The first technique is known as overshoot, and this is something that we learn from type design. Have a look at these two well-designed typefaces here. We have Castlon and GT America. Now, what you'll notice with both of them, if we zoom in a little bit and just select one of them, Illustrator leaves the baseline in for us, and you can see that the characters with a flat horizontal bottom to them, like the L and the E, sit right on the baseline, but those with a curved bottom, like the S and the O, overhang the baseline. This is called overshoot. See it here with the sans serif. We have perfectly horizontal bottoms to the L and the E, but if you have a look at the curved bottoms, the S and the O, they overshoot, they move down. Let's just make this into an outline just to demonstrate this a little bit. We can drag in some guides here. Just do it at this anchor point on the L, the top and the bottom. And you see here now with the O, you see how it overshoots both at the bottom and the top. And the reason for this is that if it wasn't like that, if it was smaller, then things wouldn't look right. I mean, what we can do now, if we just ungroup these and join them all at the bottom, we can see now they look odd, they're kind of different sizes. If we were to make this S and this L, you know, small, I know it's stretched out of perspective as well now, but it, it doesn't look right. They don't look like they are the same uh, size. The S and the O look smaller, where in the original versions here, they look correct. So this is required so it looks right optically to the eye. And that's a key thing with logo design. We use grids, we measure things, but then at the end, everything needs to look right to the eye. And overshoot is one of the things that helps it look optically balanced. So this is in evidence on the Australian Open logo. If we just kind of uh, rip this to bits, there is the overshoot. And if we were to, again, do the same thing, let's move this a quick copy, this. I'll do it proportional this time. That's roughly there with the guide. And can you see, looking at these two, the one on the left looks balanced, but on the one on the right, let me just move it a little bit further away so you can really see that. It looks like the A is dominating the O, is that little bit larger, and it loses the optical balance, even though they are the exact same height right now. So overshoot is something that will help you get that optical balance right. So if you have any curved sections next to flat sections, it can be with type, but it could be with a symbol and you want to combine them, then usually if the curved section just overshoots where the flat section goes, that will help the thing look optically balanced. The second technique is negative and small alternates. Let's go back to our slow gin type. If we had another version of this, so let's say this was our word mark, not particularly interesting really, would need a little bit more going on for to make it distinctive. But let's say we have something like this where we need to put a light type on a dark background, whereas in the primary version, the positive version, we have dark type on a light background. What happens is now in our negative version, the spaces in between the characters look smaller. So look between the O and the E here, or maybe look between the I and the N. It looks like the space is small here, but we know it's exactly the same because we just dragged out a copy. So what we, the general rule, what we want to do, because this looks a bit smaller, is just open this up. So I'll probably just go to my tracking and have a play with this. Now, obviously, we don't want it to look different. We want it to look the same. So for it to look optically the same, you want to just play around and find something which is similar. So maybe we do plus 10 on the tracking and there's something that we would uh, test. Similarly, this works for small sizes. So if we had uh, a much smaller point size here, we might have a rule where when it gets very small, we just open this up uh, a little bit so that it still works and we don't get the effect of the letters squashing into one another. That's fair enough with type. What about with symbols and more complicated shapes? How can you do that? Well, let's create something and try and demonstrate that here. So I'm just going to create some sort of uh, rough logo that has 
a strike within it, um, uh, a stroke within it, and we'll see how this works. Okay, I've quickly made this terrible symbol, but it will illustrate the point and show you the technique. Let's just drag a copy over here, something we should always do, save our work as we go through. I'm just going to click on this stroke and I'm going to expand it. Then I'm going to use the Shape Builder tool just to, whoops, making sure both shapes are selected and just delete this central part. And we've got a symbol here, okay? We can recolor it or whatnot. So what I'm going to do is just do a copy of this and just see like we did before, what about if this is on a black background? How's that gonna look? How's that gonna work in this scenario? So let's have white on black and black on white. Now have a look at these two. Again, we've got that same problem. This black line through the white circle looks smaller than the white line through the black circle. So that's something that we want to adjust. So because we've saved our work in, it's probably quicker to do it this way. If we bring this one over here, save this as a, an original. And what I'm going to do is just adjust the width of this stroke. Now if I press Command H, you can hide the extras. You can see a little bit clearer without that line going through the stroke. And we can just try and Push this up 11, 12, looking close, you can go a bit higher. That's too fat. It's somewhere around there, 12, I think. Let's go for 12. Okay, so now we know that this stroke was 10. And this is going to be 12. And we can see the effect here of these two together. So you can see that the one on the right clearly is wider but it looks like it marries up more closely with our original symbol. So this is something that you can do for negative alternates to fix this issue. And you can also do it for small sizes. Again, if this was going to be incredibly small, we might start to lose the line through the middle or it start looking too small. So you might want an option where once it gets beyond a certain size, you increase that stroke size in the middle. The use of uh, when to use these different logos would be something that you would include in the style guide so the client and any other designers working with it always use the correct logo in the correct situation. Technique number three is gradation. This is a transition from one thing to another. Now, logos which rely on continuous gradients for their form are problematic. There's often problems uh, in reproducing them, and you really want something that works uh, as a solid shape in black and white. We've seen a lot of companies over the, the last 10 to 20 years changing from complicated designs with lots of gradients in them to more flat looking logos for this reason. But we still sometimes want to have a sense of 3D or a sense of movement or a sense of progression or different layers. And how can we do that? Well, there's different forms of gradation that we can use that will actually achieve this without the need to use these you know, infinite continuous gradients that might use uh, millions of colors uh, to move through to make something that looks seamless. There's some great examples here, like this one on Rob Clark's site. He is one of the best uh, logo designer, type designers that is working today, he worked for a lot of huge companies. And this one for Oxford University Press, where we could see if this symbol was just a plain circular ring, it would just be so boring have nothing distinctive about it so here where we have this sense of the movement the spiral moving into one another 3dness of it uh, added here uh, gives it some interest so this reminds me the rob clark one of the olympic games munich 1972 which is one of my favorite identity design systems and the Woolmark, a really classic logo symbol from 1964 it looks like these, like a bowl of wool, how it's woven together. This one from Verlaine I found interesting. Using almost looks like pixels today, although this is from 1983, um, and it looks like it, it's transitioning. It's it's moving out over to the solid V on the right hand side. This one from 2013 by Rice Creative. All these plus marks are at different sizes on this O. 
so it creates this 3d effect this rounding to shape but of course it isn't these are all solid just black and white which uh, really aids at reproduction although there is a lot of detail on that one here we've got an impossible figure but just simple shading on certain sides uh, has it appear that way this one pushworks has the strokes going at different angles uh, to give it that uh, 3D blocky effect. First Fidelity Bank, the number one on the right hand side, when you squint, you really get that uh, effect that is produced and it looks kind of like a screen. And this is all done by horizontal lines. Very clever way of doing that. Well, it's a technique which has been used many times now. This one with the American Institute of Designers, these strokes taper so it begins to seem to move away and similarly with this one for very stream where we have these tapered strokes so it's like the suggestion of a of a gradient of moving from black to white and it just allows it to give the element the impression of different layers let's see if we can demonstrate that and have a go at how we might do something like that in illustrator i'm just going to draw a simple letter f using the grid here Okay, that will do for me. Again, I'm going to drag out a copy of this and make it red. I'm going to join this. I'm going to lock it for a minute. And I'm going to try this technique that we just saw with these spikes kind of going across. Now we can finesse this, but what this is clearly not right yet but what i'm trying to illustrate here is that this f is not a logo we can't use this in any sense as a logo because it's just not distinctive enough and if we were trying to create this effect maybe where we had you know the gradient underneath maybe it needs to feel like it it marries up to the top there so this kind of thing but again it's still not very distinctive and we've got the problem of this actually means all these different colors these grays here uh, being reproduced and that can lead to uh, problems as well this gradient kind of being a little bit of a dated look so what can we do with this to maybe uh, make it work a little bit better i think we're getting somewhere here i think i'm just going to fake this cutting these out by introducing a white box in your logo designs you will want to make sure you draw this out properly uh, but for now this will do the trick i'm just going to make it a red box for now move this vertical stem to the very back then make these white these red boxes white Get a little bit of that edge so i'm just going to drag them over one more we start to get this effect and th this now is something a little bit more interesting do we want it like this what you want to do is always make copies drag them out and just compare them and see is this better what about if it goes all the way to the top that feel more natural what about if it's just part way because it's just to the eye so let's just throw that in as an example now this is <laughs> done on the fly with all you guys watching me which is not how i recommend designing but if we just bring these down here and from what we had this is not a logo no distinction to it this is more distinctive but it's still very generic and difficult to reproduce doesn't really say anything this now we're starting to get into something which feels a little bit different and again if we zoom out we see how it still works we kind of squint we're getting that gradient type effect here um you can see as well by just scaling this thing down and you start to kind of experiment like what could this be like what if we actually just did a really quick uh, skew of this thing let's just shear it by like 30 degrees or too much 15 degrees it looks kind of like <laughs> motion blur now. I'm not, I'm not sure 
if that's the one. But the point is we've progressed from something completely flat and generic by using this shading thing, started to create a little bit of movement, a little bit of a sense of, of 3D-ness. And that's a technique like I showed you with all those different real world examples that you can begin to apply and experiment with in your own designs. Let us know if you'd like to see more logo design tips here on the channel. Subscribe if you haven't. And until next time, happy designing.